Hello, and welcome to another virtual edition of Exeter Bible Fellowship. We're glad to have you joining with us today, whether you're watching by the cable channel or on YouTube. Uh, just trust that this will be a time of blessing and encouragement for you. I'd like to share just a few verses from Psalm chapter 61, and I hope you'll find these an encouragement. Uh, David was very good at pouring out his heart to the Lord, regardless of his, his uh, circumstances. And uh, this is one of his lower points, it sounds like. And uh, listen to these words, Psalm 61, verse 1. Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. Read those last couple verses again. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. And I don't know what uh, struggles you may be facing today in your life. We all, of course, uh, have high and low points and I know the last uh, few months have been especially challenging uh, for most of us as we've had to adjust and make a lot of changes in our lives adjusting to the, the new normal with the lockdowns and and so on resulting from COVID. So whether you're dealing with sickness, family problems, financial issues, job loss, depression, loneliness, there are many things that we face but be encouraged that God loves you. God understands what you're going through, and he cares greatly about each one of us. And it's so good to know that we have God, our rock, who is higher than us, that we can turn to, that we can take shelter under the shadow of his wings, as we've just been reminded uh, by David in the psalm, and uh, that he is our refuge, the place to turn in times of trouble. So I hope you can take encouragement from that. Whatever you're dealing with, if you're going through a difficult time, just take it to the Lord in prayer and uh, feel the burden be lifted, uh, knowing that he is able to, to care and provide for us. He is so much stronger than us. So let's open in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that you indeed are the rock that is higher than us. We praise you and, and lift up your holy name when we contemplate who you are, your greatness, we need only look around us to see the wonderful splendor of your creation, and we are in awe. And we thank you that you love us, that you care for us. And you demonstrated that so abundantly through Christ our Savior, when you sent your only Son to the cross to die for our sin. We thank you for, for Calvary. We thank you that he rose again on the third day victorious. And we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, Lord, whatever anyone who's listening today may be feeling and, and struggling with in their life, we just pray that you would give them a real sense of your presence. And just, Lord, strengthen our faith. Help us to, to trust more in you. Forgive us when we doubt you, when we doubt your promise, when we doubt your faithfulness, when we doubt your love and provision for us. And just strengthen our faith, we pray. We ask that you would uh, be a special blessing to each one who's listening to the message this morning. May it be an encouragement and a challenge to each one of us. We thank you and pray for these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory. Amen. So again, thank you once again for joining with us. We, we hope this will be a time of blessing for you. We have a couple of songs and then John Bennett will be bringing the message. So enjoy the service, and uh, until next time, may God bless you.
Nice to be back with you again and to share God's word. But before we do, we're going to bow together in prayer and just ask his blessing upon the word of God. Our loving Heavenly Father, this, this day we thank you again for the wonderful joy and privilege of lifting our hearts to you. And Lord, you know that the word that's open before us is your word inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we pray for the inspiration and the enabling of the Holy Spirit to interpret it and to share it as you would want it shared this morning. We thank you for this year and we thank you for all that you mean to us. And we pray that as we open your truth that we will learn more and be strengthened as we face the rest of this year or as long as you tarry. So thank you again for your word and we just want to commit this time into your hand. We need your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it's nice, as I said again, to be sharing once again this morning with you. Uh, last time I was here, we were looking at Hebrews 12 and verse 1 in particular and thinking about the witnesses in chapter 11 and looking back over that uh, that uh, their lives, just a little bit, of, just a little snippet that we learn from each of them. We're coming back again this morning to Hebrews chapter 12, and we're looking in particular at verse 2. And verse 2 of Hebrews 12, well, let me read verse, 11, verse 1 as well. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, I'm told that, uh, and I understand that in long distance running, uh, there's often a pace setter, and that person leads usually from the front uh, of his teammate, and he sets the pace, meaning that then the, 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 the other competitor, his teammate, doesn't have to worry about anything except just keeping in step with the pace setter. He just has to be careful that he keeps in step. He doesn't want to lag behind. He doesn't want to run ahead. He just wants to keep in step with the pace setter. Uh, and that helps, helps him greatly, especially near the end of the race. Uh, I looked up the meaning or the definition of pace setter in the dictionary, and here's what I read. A pace setter is a person who is an experienced runner, runner tasked to complete the course. They are generally capable of running a lot faster than the pace of the race. And I, I believe that here in this scripture where it says in verse 2, we were talking about the race last time I spoke with you, it says, looking unto Jesus, 
the author and the finisher of our faith. I believe here we're looking at the great pace setter, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. When we looked at the witnesses in chapter 11, we were looking back uh, at, at, at those who had run before us. Um, but today we're looking at, at those, the one who not only has run the race before us, but he runs the race alongside us. Not only that, he's the one who actually has set the course. He has set out the course. The race is what he planned. And more than that, he gives us the strength to run the race. Now, I, I want to ask a question here because this scripture says, looking unto Jesus. The question is, why is it so important to look to Jesus? We are just into this new year a few weeks. And why is it as we seek to run the race, the Christian race in 2021, why is it important to look to Jesus? I know we were looking at those witnesses in chapter 11, but why, why is the writer here emphasizing the looking to Jesus? I think there are many reasons, and one of the first ones I want to mention is because even the best of all the other witnesses failed in some area. If I was to go back to all those I mentioned last time in chapter 11, people like Abraham and Moses and Noah and all these great men had failed in some area of life. Because you see, the Bible tells us that we've all sinned. There's not a single person that has ever lived apart from Jesus Christ himself who has lived a sinless life. Everyone has failed in an area, some area in life. Some, we might say, seem on the surface of it, look to be greater sinners than others. And yet, I don't know if we can measure sin like that. If we break the law, we've broken the law and we're guilty. Uh, and the reason why it's so important to look to Jesus is because all others have failed. It's also important to look to Jesus because he is the one who ran a perfect race. And if you were going to run a marathon and you were looking for a pace setter to set the pace, to run with you, to set an example, you wouldn't come to me and ask me to run with you or to set an example to you because I have never run a marathon and even if I tried to run one, I probably wouldn't get very far along the, the, the way. I don't know much about it. But you would go and search for somebody who had been successful in the race. And it's important to look to Jesus because he is the one who has run a perfect race. Now I have to say that not everybody when Jesus was on earth, not everybody thought Jesus was running the perfect race. In fact, even in the Old Testament, if we go back to Isaiah chapter 53, and we, we read, I want to read these words, a, a reasonable length of passage here to you, just talking about this same Jesus. And it says, speaking of him in Isaiah 53, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire in him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet he esteemed him, we esteemed him smitten of God, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. 
because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. You know, we haven't time to go and study these script these verses in, in any kind of detail just now, but if you stop and read and reread that Isaiah 53, those verses, it doesn't remind you of somebody who was successful in the race, does it? It's a man who, it says here, he, 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 he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before his tears, he is dumb. It says in verse 8, he was cut off from the land of the living. I mean, it looks like we're talking about a failure here. Somebody who might have started out with great intentions, but he failed and he's hanging on a cross. He's dead. And when we look at the New Testament, we read in Mark chapter 14 and verse 50, it tells us he had a number of disciples around him. And it says when the pressure was on, they all forsook him and fled. Doesn't seem very like a successful one, does it? One of his disciples that had been with him for three years, Judas, actually betrayed him to the authorities, handed him over. Another disciple who had been with him for three years, Peter, actually cursed and swore he didn't even know him. And when Jesus was taken to die, he was nailed to a cross among thieves died among the thieves. He didn't have a grave to be buried in. In fact, he was buried in a borrowed grave. The only thing he left behind him, uh, as far as worldly possessions were, were the clothes that he wore. It doesn't actually speak of somebody who was successful, does it? That's in human eyes. In the eyes of the world, he might have been seen to be a failure. But you know, Jesus didn't view the moment when the nails were driven into his hands and his feet and the crown of thorns were placed on his brow as the end of the road. Jesus saw beyond all of that. And in the road race of life that we're living in and we're called upon to run, we're told to look unto Jesus because he was the one who ran a perfect race. It didn't mean that he was outwardly successful in everything <clears throat> that he did from a human point of view. But the Bible tells us, speaking of Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame. And now he's set down on the right hand of the throne of God. You see, Jesus saw beyond the cross. He saw beyond the crown of thorns. He saw beyond those nails that were driven in <coughs> to his hand and the spear into his side. See, we're prone to judge the race by what we see and hear right now. We're prone to judge success or otherwise by whether we are accepted by the crowd or rejected by the crowd. We so often judge by praise or criticism. If we're praised, we think we're doing well. If we're criticized, we think we're not doing so well. Or maybe it's material possessions. If business is going well and we're pr pro prospering materially, then we see that as success. Or in Christian service and Christian work, if there are big numbers are gathering and we're attracting a big crowd, we see it as success. <clears throat> but not so with Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus judged success not by these markers. <clears throat> he saw beyond all of these things. And I have no idea what 2021 will hold for you or for me. I don't know what pain any one of us will suffer. I don't know what tragedy any of one of us will have to face in our family, in our life, in our community. I don't know what we will see before this COVID-19 
pandemic uh, has run its course. But you see, even though we might be affected by some of these things, that does not determine whether we have been a, a success or a failure on the race of life, the spiritual race. Success and failure is not judged by part way through the race. Success is judged when we cross the finishing line. And that's so important for us to keep in mind because Jesus, while he lived on earth from a human point of view, could have been looked upon as a miserable failure. Like his closest friends forsook him. They denied him. They betrayed him. They weren't there when he needed them. No. But Jesus, when we look to him, we're looking to one who was successful in the race. Because now he has won the crown and he's seated in glory. He saw beyond the challenge. Why is it important to look to Jesus? Because all these other witnesses failed in some area. But because Jesus ran the perfect race. A third reason why it's important to look to Jesus is because he is the author or originator. The one from whom all salvation and all success in the race comes, it says here, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We're looking to the one who planned the race. Planned the race. Oh, how wonderful it is to enter into a race with the person who planned it. If you know the course, what a difference it will be when you're going to run the race. In fact, uh, runners, cyclists, people who are entering into races, if it's road races or whatever it is, they will study the course. They want to know every bend, every twist, every hill, uh, up or down, whatever it is. They want to know it perfectly so that they can run that race. Well, we look to Jesus because he knows every inch of the way every turn on the road, every hill that we're going to face, every mountain we have to cross, looking unto Jesus. Oh, how wonderful it is to know that. He is the finisher and the perfecter. He not only sets the course, but he empowers us to complete it. Like I said uh, in the last message, he empowers us. He is the one who gives us the power and the grace and the strength to complete the course that he has set for us. We look to him who has gone before us, who runs with us, and by the Holy Spirit runs through us. Have you got that? He is the one who has run the race before us, so he knows it. He is the one who runs with us, alongside us. And he is the one who runs the race through us. I think that's one of the most amazing parts about this race. That Jesus doesn't leave us to run the race ourselves. He actually, he runs the race through us. He wants to stand in our shoes. He wants to control our will, our mind, our strength. He wants to control us. He wants to run this race this year through us. Not by might, the Bible says. Not by power. But it's by my spirit running the race through us. See how our whole perspective on life and on a new year changes when we look unto Jesus. It, he, it is now Christ living in and living through me and you. See, if it was left up to me to decide what I was going to do this year, if it was left up to me to decide how this year was going to go, 
I might sit down and plan all these nice things that I would like to do and places I'd like to go and people I'd like to see and things I'd like to have. But it's likely I would make a mess of it all. Because I, you know what? Some, there are people who are among the most miserable people in the entire world who have got billions of money stored up and every single thing they could have ever wanted, they've got it, but they don't have peace. They don't have Christ. And Christ wants to be in us and run the race through us. But we also have to remember this, that the Christ who we read of in, in uh, Isaiah 53 is the Christ who was despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and a man acquainted with grief. And you know, if he's running that race through us, this flesh of ours might have to endure some of that despising, some of that acquainted with grief. But we're looking onto him who went through it all and won victoriously because now he's seated victoriously on the throne. Any Flint Johnson, Johnson wrote these words, which you probably know. God has not promised skies ever blue, flower-strewn pathway all our lives through. God has not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. But here's what he promised. But God has promised strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above unfailing sympathy, undying love, looking unto Jesus. Let's take a look at him. How did he face temptation? The Bible tells us he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. How did Jesus face temptation? Because you know what? I can guarantee this. There's not one single person listening to my voice today who will not face temptation. Every single person faces temptation. Satan sees to it, of course. How did Jesus face temptation? Well, you remember when it, Satan came to tempt him in the wilderness. Remember what he faced him with? He faced him with the word of God. He faced him with the word of God. And we're looking on to Jesus, friends. I trust that this year you will let the word of God Sink into your heart and life. And when temptation comes, go to the word of God and see what the word of God has to say. You know, people ask questions. Is this right or is that not right? Is it right to do this? Is it right to do that? Friends, you'll get the answer in the word of God. If you've got the answer in the word of God, you've got a word of authority. If it's just my word and I say, <clears throat> oh, you shouldn't do that or you should do that, that's, that's my word if it's not based on the word of God. And when Jesus faced temptation, he always said to Satan, it is written. It is written. And that's, the <clears throat> that's how we should face temptation this year. See how he faced criticism and false accusation. He was criticized. He was accused falsely. But what does it say? When he was reviled, he reviled not again. Wouldn't that be wonderful testimony of every believer? in Exeter Bible Chapel or everyone listening to my voice today, if that was to be your attitude and your reaction. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. He didn't react in a wrong way. No, he didn't. May God help us to be such that we'll leave that in God's hand to deal with. See how he faced the death of a loved friend. I think it's important for us. Remember when Lazarus died and we come to John chapter 11 and verse 35 and we read, we read these words of Jesus, the shortest verse in the Bible, it's just two words. It says, Jesus wept. There is nothing wrong with weeping. Sometimes, you know, people feel condemned if they weep. 
They're going through a trial. They're going through a difficult time. They're going through a time of great testing. And, and they feel as if they're letting God down if they weep. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Even when he saw death. Lazarus had died. He wept. But he didn't weep without hope. Because it tells us in the same chapter, verses 25 and 26 of John 11, <clears throat> Jesus said these words. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. You know, you may have lost a loved one last year. You may lose a loved one this year. Friends, don't be afraid of tears. But remember this, if your loved one had their faith in Jesus Christ and they were trusting him as their savior, you can weep tears, but with confident hope that they are with Christ. And that's the difference for the Christian. See how Jesus faced temptation with the word of God. He faced criticism by not reviling back. He faced death of a loved one with tears, but with hope. See how he faced the cross. How did Jesus face the cross? Well, we get a glimpse of it in, in Gethsemane. Remember there on his knees before the Father in, in, in heaven as he prayed in Gethsemane. And he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But he said this, nevertheless, not my will, thine be done. If you and I can say that all through 2021, every single morning you can get up and say, Father, not my will, thine be done. You'll have a great year. You might face trial. You might even have to face the cross. Jesus did. But he was surrendered to the will of God. See how Jesus faced all of these things. He says, looking unto Jesus... If you want an example of how to face whatever it is you will face this year, just look to Jesus. You might ask this question, well, where can I find him? If I want to look to Jesus, where do I find him? <clears throat> well, the best place to find him, of course, is in the word of God. This book from Genesis right through to Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. The book of Acts, the writer speaking, uh, right in the book of Acts speaks and says the revelation of Jesus Christ. The whole Bible is a revelation of Christ. In the Old Testament, he may be a little bit more hidden there speaking, uh, but he's there right in creation, right? The first verses of Genesis, Christ is, is there and right through. So if you want to find Jesus, you want to look to Jesus, look into the mirror of the word of God. Search it, read it, digest it, learn it, obey it. This is where you'll find him in the word of God. Not only in the written word, it's all about Christ, but in the place of prayer. If I can urge you and I'm... Speaking, I trust to those who believe in prayer, but friends, if I can urge you, make prayer a priority in your life in 2021. We're going to look to Jesus. We'll see him in the word. We'll see him as we wait before him in prayer. As we bow in his presence and draw near to God, the Bible says in James, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. When we get our eyes off Christ, you know, we're pretty well sure to deviate off course. Remember what I said at the beginning, the pace setter. He's running ahead. He knows where he's going. He knows the pace that he wants to set. He knows the race. He knows the road. And you get your eyes on him and you keep your eyes on him. And he'll bring you right to the end victoriously. And we see him not only in the word of God, not only in the place of prayer, but we see him in the pages of history. We see him in the pages of history. We had a, a, a teacher in, in, in college and he used to constantly be saying this. History is his story. 
And he would say that almost every time he would stand to, to give us a lecture. He would say, history is his story. And if you look through the pages of history, you see the whole panorama of his story. The story of Christ. How else can all the fulfilled prophecies be explained? When you look through the scripture and see all the prophecies that be fulfilled throughout the years, the Old Testament prophesying the coming of Christ and all the things that have happened to Israel, how else could you explain it? It's his story. How else could you explain the great revivals and spiritual awakenings? How can they be understood apart from seeing them as his story? We see him in these things. The great awakenings, they tell, the historians tell us that in those years before Wesley and Whitfield, England was in an awful state, ripe for revolution and disaster. But then God raised up a couple of men. In fact, many more joined him. But God raised up those who had met Christ and who put their eyes upon him. And God transformed England by a great spiritual awakening and revival. We see him in the pages of history. In the biographies of the great missionary states people of the world. You, there's no explanation for the amazing things that happened all over the world except for the fact that it was him, Jesus, who was at work by his spirit. So we see him in the pages of scripture. We see him in the place of prayer. We see him in the pages of history. Looking unto Jesus. It would be a great exercise instead of complaining and mourning over what's happening in the world instead of mourning over the disaster of COVID and all of these things, if we were to look to Jesus and we were to ask this question, not complaining about circumstances, but ask, Lord, what are you doing through these circumstances? What a difference. Looking unto Jesus. See, some people see this pandemic as a, 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 a plague that is a disaster. And there are others who see this as a means in the hand of God to turn people's attention to the, their need of Christ. I tend to look at it that way. I tend to see this pandemic that has been prevalent around the world as God allowing something happen to waken people up to a need of Jesus Christ as their Savior. Let us see how vulnerable we are. You know... Any of us, anyone listening to my voice today could come in contact with that virus and within a very short space of time could be leaving this world via death. And God is wanting to wake us up and say, listen, you're vulnerable. You need to get right with me. You need to give your life to Christ. Looking unto Jesus. Oh, friends, thank God we can find him. And we can see him. When Daniel was thrown in the den of lions, he found him there. He was with him. Closed the, den, the lion's mouth. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the ferny, fiery furnace, he came and he actually walked in the fire with them. Paul, when he was cast in a prison cell, Jesus came right there with him, looking unto Jesus. He has promised, as we face this year, he has promised his presence will go with us. He has promised that his power will enable us. He has promised that his provision will sustain us. He has promised that his purpose, his plan, is to refine us. God's plan is to refine us and to make us more like him. There's a little chorus that perhaps you have sung and know it. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. There's another verse to that chorus. It says, keep your eyes upon Jesus. 
Let nobody else take his place, so that hour by hour you may prove his power, till at last you have run the great race, looking unto Jesus. Romans 12, 1 and 2, which I referred to last time I spoke again, and I want to refer back to that because I was wanting you to couple Romans 12, 1 and 2 with Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, and study those four verses together and understand them. Uh, and I think there's the recipe for success in the race of life this year. But I'm going to read these two passage of scripture now in a new, newer translation. It's in the New Living Translation, which I just read yesterday, and, and I, I was taken with the, the way they put these verses. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Listen to it. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. That was Romans 12, 1 and 2. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 in that New Living Translation is this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding the shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Two wonderful passages of scripture. I pray that there will be a hallmark of your life and my life this year. And I want to finish by a little quote that I understand King George quoted in his Christmas uh, address to the nation in 1939 when Europe was in the midst of great turmoil and tragedy and trial. And he said this, I said to the man at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness, put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light and safer than the known way. Put your hand into the hand of God, and that shall be better than light and safer than the known way. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. May God help us to put our life in his hand, to get our eye fixed upon him, and to walk in obedience to his command throughout this year. You'll find him in the word. You'll find him in prayer. You'll find him in history. May God lead us to him every moment of every day in every situation. Thank you again, and we just close with a little word of prayer again this morning. Our loving Heavenly Father, I just thank you again this morning for the fact that we can look to Jesus. We know that he is the author and the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. We thank you that he endured the cross. He despised the shame. And we thank you today that he is seated at the right hand of glory. And we thank you, Father, for that ultimate victory. And that you are the one who wants to lead us in victory. And I pray that you will lead every person who hears this message today in a life of victory. Victory over sin and the world and the devil and the flesh. A life that will honor you and exalt you throughout 2021. And that, Father, as we have entered into the race, that we will run that race with endurance, faithful to the end. So bless us now, we pray in Jesus' precious name.